The Earth disappears and you get close to the space station for some stupid reason. I, I'm yelling at my software engineers, but anyway. Oh, it's really gone. It, well, it's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway. That is, as you say, a problem. It is. <laughs> ah, we're lost in space. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Roland. Welcome to Hackerspace. Uh, can I quick show of hands, please? Is your first time in Hackerspace? Anyone? <laughs> oh, fair number. Okay. So, we are uh, a group. We do roughly two things. One is we operate as a community center for the primarily tech community, although we have sort of other interesting people, um, as we'll see later this evening. Um, and during the day, to pay the rent, we actually operate as a co-working space. So, the number of members who actually pay members here. Specifically, to work out how to work, what these desks and chairs are about, and they're set up differently to the day for obvious reasons. Uh, we do have a supply of soft drinks at the, at the, at the door. Please help yourself. Uh, please consider a small donation when you do so. This evening is the first uh, episode first, whatever it is, of the first uh, of many glorious. The first of many yes. glorious yes. awesome yes. talks. Yes. Glorious <laughs> talks. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We'll stick with awesome. But the, this was, uh, uh, Hackerspace has sort of veered almost entirely in the tech direction in the last year or two. And so Lewis and I got talking to get desirable to do something a bit broader. And so, well, how about something like Blink Blank, which disappeared when Isaac moved back to Launch World? Yeah, we should talk to you again. <laughs> and it's like, hmm, yes, let's do that. And will we call it Blink Blank? Or <laughs> and I, I sort of threw out Hackerspace Awesome Talks, and that turned out to be the right thing to call it. So, welcome and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we have two amazing speakers tonight, uh, but at this point I will yield to Julian to explain to you who the first piece. Thank you, Roland. Um, so, so that was where we had the conversation and found out what SEO fail actually meant. Um, so welcome to Hackerspace Awesome Talks. None of us have had some very really sad. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so Carter, Carter, we've got two speakers today, um, completely different, so I'm quite excited. Carter is our very first presenter. He's been kind of talking on and off and giving us tantalizing glimpses of his work already. Um, I'm not sure whether you know, but there is a Hollywood star that's named after the place where you work. Um, so you can go find that out in, 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 in the break in between. It is actually true. Um, so he's an astro visualizer, which probably meant he invented his own job. Um, and, and <laughs> Title, at least. <laughs> well, both, ideally. Yeah, so I, I think it's good to invent your own job. Yeah. Uh, it, it means that you know it, it's quite special, and, and and as we were chatting, um, as he was searching up, um, we we figured that he was a kind of translator because he takes all this data um, and shows it and, and, and thinks about how to present it as a kind of experience. So if you've been to any planetarium around the world, you may well have seen um, the work of him and his team. Uh, he's got quite a lot of amazing stuff to show us, including the edges of the universe. So I'm going to shut up now and uh, hand it over to her. Okay. Well, thank you, um, and and thanks for all all you coming out to <laughs> to see this. Um, I'm going to try to do it justice. I I'm not sure if we can turn the lights down uh, if, if that uh, or off. Um, and um, so yeah, as Chile had, had introduced me, this has been a lifelong passion. Um, I was born in 1961, which was the year that we first went into space, and. Uh, uh, I went to something called the 1964 World's Fair, uh, which was in, uh, was in New York, in Flushing Meadow, uh, in Queens, New York, in 1964 and 65. Um, my uncle flew Mustang, uh, he was a Mustang pilot in World War II, um, the Mustang um, uh, fighter plane. And so my brother, who was 10 years older than me, loved models of airplanes and hung them up. My, later, my brother later became a pilot. Um, and uh, so at the 64 World's Fair, uh, he showed me the space capsule. My brother showed me the space capsule, and it didn't have any wings. And I said, how come it doesn't have wings? Because uh, it flies. And he goes, well, you don't need wings to fly in outer space. And I didn't know what outer space was. So that really began my interest in this. So I'm hopefully going to take you through some of this uh, um, on out through the database of what we call the digital universe. And we put this together to feed 
essentially the planetarium of the 21st century is what we were calling it as a millennium project at the time. And uh, as you can see here, showing all sorts of satellites. I am going to be interactive with you right here. I'm going to turn off the communication satellites or not. Let's see. Um, and uh, by the way, this software that you're seeing was developed by my, my uh, students from Linköping University in Sweden. Um, and I started working with them uh, thanks to meeting at SIGGRAPH uh, 2001. I, uh, we had a, a course about doing dome production um, at SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles. And um, after the presentation, this, this rather reserved Swedish professor came up to me, gave me his card, uh, Anders Innerman. And um, he, uh, he mentioned uh, Linshipping University in a town called Norshipping, Sweden. It all sounded like gingerbread to me. I <laughs> never heard of this place. And, um, but he was rather persistent, and he offered me one of his star students. Um, he showed up with a group of about a dozen colleagues in the spring of 2002. I had forgotten they were coming, so I was in cutoff shorts and a torn up t-shirt that said, back off man, I'm a scientist. And they were all in suits and ties. And <laughs> I embarrassed poor Anders, I guess. But nevertheless, um, one of the guys that was there was Bertolt Anderson, who is now the president of NTU. So I had a meeting with him the other day. And we're looking at doing a collaboration between Lynn Shipping and NTU. Uh, and I'm here on a residency with the Singapore Science Center. And they just put in an 8K, meaning 8,000 pixel wide, 23 meter dome, which is incredible. And um, the software that they bought actually runs our digital universe database. And, uh, but this is different software. This is, this is a competitor to what they bought. But still, <laughs> it's, um, it's not bad because this, this, this shows all the satellites. And it kind of turns the satellite action off for a second. Um, let's see. Just going to turn off a, let's see. Because we kind of get, get the gist of the satellites. I'll turn them off. And I'll, there, I'm leaving up the uh, ISS, so the International Space Station. It only orbits about 400 kilometers off the surface. And the atmosphere is properly represented. We see swathes of data that are collected. This was yesterday, essentially, um, by a NASA satellite called Terra. It's a twin satellite uh, called Aqua, um, also paints a daily picture. They've been taking this picture of the Earth not only in red, green, blue, so we get this nice view of what it looks like to us, but also in various infrared wave bands. And so it's part of NASA's Earth Observatory. And um, so the difference of the two satellites, one, this Terra takes sort of a morning view. And then Aqua gets kind of an afternoon view. So what we can do is we can really come down, see a quarter kilometer resolution. Uh, I'm online right now with uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So if I come in, um, we might just wait and see it resolve. And also I have time running, so let's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna stop time. <laughs> and I don't wanna sit here waiting for the internet, so. But uh, I do wanna emphasize as we look across perhaps the Arabian Peninsula, I'll drop this down. The thickness of the, ap uh, of the atmosphere is correct. It's only about 30 kilometers. That's less, that's about, that's, you know, so Singapore is 50 kilometers wide. So go straight up 30 kilometers and you're, you're where the atmosphere turns black on the day side. The atmosphere continues up. That's why the space station or orbits up about 400 kilometers. But you can see how hugging the Earth that, uh, that we actually do. It's almost like a high altitude airplane when you're in the space station. But you have to go, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be going through I'm, gonna, uh, I'm used to miles an hour. So 17,500 miles an hour is the speed you have to maintain to stay in orbit up there. You go around the Earth every 90 minutes. If I come around the night side, we can see the city lights. So we see the coast of Vietnam on up to Hainan. We see uh, here is Hong Kong, here is Shanghai, and then Japan. This is Taiwan. And uh, so I'll come back. So I'm navigating from this side. I'm going to not bother you with the controls um, that I see up here. Okay, great. I want to pull away from this and take you out farther. See, so, you know, we all see the moon in the sky, but how far away is the moon? It's 400,000 kilometers, but to get a sense of that, 
Um, you know, that's how far away the moon is. We see now it's its trail. And we see the backdrop of the stars. All well, that's accurate. Um, and uh, let me just pull around so that we can see the moon. And I'm going to come a little closer to it. And if I come in and see the moon, if I see the Earth and the moon together, I'm seeing a side of the moon that we don't normally see. This is the far side of the moon. The dark side of the moon, which Pink Floyd talked about, was that's, <laughs> you know, that's the unlit side. And the moon does rotate. It takes one month or one moon, <laughs> essentially, as it goes around the Earth. Um, and uh, so that, that, whoa, I mean to do that, sorry. Ricochet. What I need to do is kind of center on the moon. So I'm going to do that for us for a second. Moon. Target it. Okay. And if I come in close, then we can kind of recreate uh, what the astronauts saw for the first time in 1968. Uh, they were not expecting it. It was not in the flight plan. When all of a sudden outside the window, uh, Bill Landers said, hey, give me the camera. And he saw the <laughs> Earth rise. And the first shot of it was taken in black and white. And they were like, where's the color film? We actually took a lot of black and white at the moon because the moon is gray. And NASA was economizing on film. Can you believe that? $25 billion <laughs> to get to the moon. And they were still economizing. So actually, what I want to do is go online with us here. Woo. In fact, I'm going to turn on the headlight for the moon. So, okay. Oh, shut up. Okay, here we go. Here we, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. I have to do this and then add it and save and then, okay, and now what I want to do is actually turn on the moon's headlight. Whoa. There we go. So now, uh, and also, here's Messier, which is a double crater. It's down below. So it looks like a comet. That was a grazing impact. And what I'm doing, I'm sort of mentioning this as I'm flying around. I'll come in on it. This is supposed to get a lot better in a second. I'm just waiting for that and I don't see any error messages. I think I'm just waiting for the internet here. Come on. Let me pull out, do this sort of action sometimes. That helps. Whoa. Okay. All right. Let's see. And come on, moon. Okay. I'm waiting for the server from NASA. There. Okay. So this is Messier. And you can see, actually, if I come in close, it's kind of cool. This crater. It's like a butterfly, the first one here, where the debris went out like this, and then the second one came in. It hit twice and decapitated and threw all that, that debris out that way. So it was a grazing impact. And uh, so we can really kind of explore the moon. There's a lot of stuff on the moon. But I want to show you one thing in particular, one crater, which is a very prominent crater on the moon. It's one of the youngest craters on the moon. It's right here. And you see all these rays reaching out from it. It's a crater Tycho, and Tycho has a central peak, which is about uh, 3,000 meters, and its flat floor that we see right in front of us is 50 kilometers wide, so your nation could fit right <laughs> in there, <laughs> which is kind of cool, you know? And um, so here we go, and uh, if, if, if this wasn't cool enough, let's come down and Try to get inside it here, More and I, I huh? Oh yes. Oh. Okay, I'm I'm trying to stop my motion. So okay, there we go. All right, and let me just come back like this. So here's the central peak. But if we want to see it even better, let me add in something else. This resolution is a hundred meter resolution. Okay. And I'm going to add in now. Hello. Oh, I need the. Narrow angle camera and Apollo 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, there's a whole bunch of different things to look at in here, and I just have to pick the right one. There we go. Tyco. Add. Slide it to the top. Boink. Okay, and now I'm waiting for that data to come in. There it is. It'll get better. Let it conform. This is sub-meter resolution. We'll see it here in a second. Let's come in. And you'll see that, has, that, that NASA chose different lighting, you know, because they, they didn't just want one side totally in shadow. So let me come in on this side. You can also see that there are not many craters down here on what looks kind of like a cookie or a brownie. 
Um, <laughs> this was molten floor, and we've actually dated this crater. We know that it's about 110 million years old. And uh, so if I tip over now, we can see what this looks like. And um, whoa, at this point I have to remember to cut the sensitivity of the mouse. So I'll flow a little, uh, fly a little nicer, flow a little smoother. But we start coming into scree slopes on the side of this. We all know about the, uh, maybe you've seen pictures of the lunar car. We had, a, we had a buggy on the moon. Well, uh, they also designed, but never flew it, a lunar cherry picker. And it was a rocket-powered bucket to carry an astronaut up to these outcroppings. And so they were considering landing in this crater. Jim McDivitt, the Apollo astronaut, said, over my dead body. And uh, so they didn't want, they were scared off about coming into Tycho Crater. But still, this is pretty amazing, it's, especially when you do this in the dome, it's like you're there. So the moon is interesting in that it's so small that it can't hold an atmosphere, and it's our nearest neighbor. Oh, actually, see this cool, uh, right over here, there's this big block that landed after it was ejected and then just came right back down, boom, landed on the top of that peak. And so at this point, all this, uh, the, uh, the background stuff looks fuzzy now at uh, the comparison to resolutions. But let me pull up and out of here because there's a lot of ground I, ground I want to cover. Well, okay. What's that? Uh, land and spacecraft is it this? The, presumably, yeah. presumably there are. Uh, Apollo oh yeah, you want to see an Apollo? Who wants to see an Apollo landing? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I got I got this argument with somebody at NTU. It's sort of like, well, I don't really believe we were there. I was like, <laughs> oh, you know, okay, well, okay, there are always those people around. Um, so anyway, let me come up to Pallas Putridinus, the Putrid Sea. <laughs> um, so over here is, this is sort of one of the eyes of the old man on the moon, but um, my friends from China like to talk about the rabbit in the moon. So that's sort of the big belly of the rabbit. Here's the, here's the head and here are the ears that stick out. So this is uh, Mari Imbrium, this is Serenitatis, this is Tranquilitatis. Right down here is Apollo 11's landing site. Right up here in the dark area is Apollo 17's. And right over here is the most beautiful landing site. I can't navigate, I have to navigate from this window. Is right along the Apennine front, named after the mountains down the spine of Italy, is this area called the Putrid Sea. I don't know who named that, but... Uh, um, and it looks like a river, but that's actually where lava flowed at one point. And we're going to come up on the Apennine front. And so uh, Dave Scott, commander of Apollo 15, I showed him this. And he said to me, he said, well, you know, it was so pretty when we were coming in. That's Lovejoy and coming over that. And we had to, they had to come over this mountain range and come in and land. And he said it was the steepest descent of any of the lunar modules. And he said it was so beautiful that he turned to, to Jim, his co-pilot, and they just smiled at one another. And he says it's not in the transcript, but they were just acknowledging how beautiful it was. So we'll come in. That's Mount Hadley, about 16,000 feet tall. And here is the two-kilometer wide um, Hadley Rill down below us. And at this point, I need to bring up that high res that we saw just like the other layer and let me go grab that. I'm requesting it, I'm waiting for it. Ding, here it comes. Um, okay, add that in. Apollo 15 image mosaic, boom. Put that on the top and wait for it. Okay, let it adjust. And now I have to really, uh, oh, I'm gonna get my flying skills in here. I have to see, I, I don't have, I, actually I do have a bookmark, but I'm gonna, I wanna bring it down to you because I, I memorized where it is pretty much. Okay, let's come in for a landing. Right over here. Boop, 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 boop. I'm waiting for the resolution. Oh, I already see it. Okay, excellent. And if I come in close enough, I'll start piercing the, the screen, but oh, I can I can see the rover. Cool. All right. Da, 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 da. Oh, 
Oh, it's sensitive. This. Okay. Now. Okay. I'll grab my cursor, bring it over here. That is the descent stage of Falcon. You can see its shadow, and you can see two horns on the shadow. Those are the flame deflectors for the RCS jets, the, uh, the reaction control jets, uh, to keep things level. And uh, so we see the sun glinting off the foil, and we see the track of the rover, and the rover sitting here. It's sitting, it's sitting to the east because as the ascent stage took off, it went that way, that way. And so they controlled a guy in, Hu in Houston at Mission Control. They called him Captain Video. He was uh, basically um, controlling the, 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 with a joystick the uh, video camera as they took off. And you can also see over here, this is the ALSEP station, the Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package. And you can see the tracks going back and forth. Um, and then you can see rover tracks going off to the rill. And so that's, there's Apollo 15. Let's see if I can get even closer. Da, 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 da. It's actually, this, this projector is bright enough. Whoa, and it's just really hard to control this. My apologies. There we go. You can start to see some of that better. Ladies and gentlemen, the moon. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> wow, applause. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, I love you guys. This is great. You should come back to Singapore more often. Okay. <laughs> um, Behind us all is, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. that's Alpha Centauri, and here's the Southern Cross and the Milky Way. Over here is Antares, and this is Scorpius, if you're a scorpion. And um, so what I'm going to do is move us around the moon a little bit. And that bright section of the Milky Way, we're going to talk about in just, uh, just coming up, that's the uh, center of our Milky Way galaxy. And if we move around... I'm going to move around so that I can see the sun, is that the Milky Way in brightness dies off. And here we are, uh, like, I, the lighting of the moon, I think I'll turn the sunlight, sun illumination back on. And we're looking back toward the sun. There we go. And we can see now over, over Orion. Orion is in the lower portion. Let me get my cursor over there. Here's the belt of Orion. There's Betelgeuse, and this is Sirius, the Dog Star, and Procyon, Pollux and Castor, Capella, and Aldebaran. Here's the Pleiades. And we can see the winter Milky Way is in stark contrast to the, the bright um, summer Milky Way, as we say that in the northern hemisphere, the opposite uh, in um, uh, the southern hemisphere, of course. So what I'm going to do is now pull out. And uh, it would not be complete if I didn't show you Mars. I really must show you Mars. I'm going to... I'm going to show you Mars a little bit here uh, because here's a story with this, this database. We've had many uh, missions to Mars, and uh, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos, and it's a world about half the size of Earth. Uh, the moon is a quarter of the size of Earth. Um, so Mars is not geologically active anymore, but we see now in front of us the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And uh, when I'm back home, I say it's the size of New York State. Uh, how many kilometers across? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, the caldera could fit, um, uh, could fit Singapore. That's easily 50 kilometers up there at, at, uh, at that caldera. But if we want to see this better, I have a better data set. And I'm not sure. Okay, come on. Ding, ding. Hello. Okay, there we go. And plutonium on Mars. Again. Mars. I got uh, CTX. Great. Okay. This is a data set that when it pops up here, come on. Oh, stop being slow. Okay, there we go. It's incomplete, so it's not the whole planet. But, and I think I actually cached. Um, so this, I'm working off a data cache that's on my disk. This data set goes down to um, globally, it's, it's about 75% of Mars, but it goes down to 6 meter resolution. This room is probably, well, this room is longer than 6 meters, I would say. 
And so um, you can see Mars in in at excruciating detail. If I tip it over, here's the caldera. I'll turn this red. And uh, so, or reddish. Every projector is different. Is this data from NASA? This is data from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from NASA. That's correct. As I, as I say in America, this is your tax dollars at work. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, the data has to sort of page in. Well, I didn't want to do that. Let's go. Okay. Let me go back. Um, I know it happened. My, I, my sensitivity on the mouse, excuse me, I have to turn that back down. My software developers, I'm like, guys, why don't you use proximity to actually adjust your sensitivity? But anyway. I'm not going to bitch and moan about software right now. But that's uh, part, part of my job is to bitch and moan about software. Now, another thing is that it has to paste the image onto a height map. And so it's actually searching for both of those right now. And um, on a laptop, on my MacBook Pro, it's a little slow. I'm r and I'm also running Windows on my poor Mac. It hates it when I do that. I always have to apologize. Um, it gets me back later, believe me. So um, in any event, this is what the caldera of Olympus Mons looks like. And it really looks like that. So this database at six meters, 75% uh, of Mars, is five and a half terabytes. And so I've just cached a little bit of that for you for your viewing pleasure here. What so the what's that? What might fit on the laptop? What's <laughs> that? Yeah, no, I could get a hang of drive. And these days I could hang a drive off it pretty much have it. But I want to go over to um, the canyon. And so I'm getting there. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Better go slower. Here we are. Noctis Labyrinthus. This means the uh, labyrinth of night. And this is where um, uh, this is where Valles Marinara sort of breaks up into a cataract canyon that we see down below us. And there's some really beautiful stuff down here. I want to bring you down to the widest part of the canyon which is about 300 kilometers across. And this canyon is uh, about 5,000 kilometers in width. So it's the largest canyon in the solar system. And as I come in, we can see some excruciating detail on this. It's actually quite nice. And let me just come down a little lower for us. Let the mountains grow. And so, as a solution to looking at this, in the dome, this is extraordinary because it really feels like you're flying over a landscape. And, but it's an alien landscape. Oh, come on. There, okay. And so I brought musicians in. We've had some Tibetan musicians come in. We, uh, my buddy Keith is a composer, uh, has, has a master's in music theory, went to the Juilliard School and all this. And so we work together as this kind of band. So we loosely call ourselves the Mars Band because <laughs> there's so much to fly over. It's astounding. And you can really kind of, you know, with all, all this sort of behavioral aspect, that my slow drive um, that uh, is happening. I hate when the mountains grow like this in front of us. But still, that doesn't happen in our dome. And you can fly over this landscape for hours and hours. And I can talk about it. I can talk about the geology. In a lot of cases, the geology is still sort of up for grabs as, as far as what's going on, really. And so but you're immersed in this landscape. If I went to Mars, I don't want to just, you know, burrow into the ground, which is what you're going to have to do to protect yourself from radiation, because it doesn't have a magnetosphere. And, and it also doesn't have much of an atmosphere. So incoming debris. You see these little craters everywhere. It's a reminder that it's a pretty dangerous area. And, um, but lots of sand dunes and all this. I would want to fly over Mars like this. But now with the data that's on Earth, we can do that. And it's pretty astounding. So, but uh, there's a lot more of the universe I want to show you. So anyway, let me just pull up here quick. And let's pull away. Got it. What's up? <laughs> oh, am I over? About 10 minutes. Okay, oh, 10 minutes, excellent. Okay, that's enough to cover the universe. Um, <laughs> it's kind of boring after after Mars, you know. Okay, so anyway, um, let's let's pull back. And I want to. Um, okay, we can pull back like this. Whoa. Okay, we got the solar system here. Um, as you probably all know, the sun is eight minutes 
old when you look at it in the sky. It's taken light eight minutes to get to us. It's 400,000 kilometers and 93 million miles or whatever it is. Um, and uh, so uh, 400 million, 300 million kilometers? Lots. Whatever. It's far. Okay. But it's really far. It's about three and a half billion miles out, er, sorry, miles, out to Pluto. And Pluto, you see, is that blue line there. And there's Neptune, the orbit of Neptune. So if I just show you here, this is about four hours of light traverse time. And so the diameter of the solar system, if you th want to think of Neptune's orbit as a diameter, is eight light hours, or a work day. And of course, uh, uh, three times eight is 24. Well, conveniently, I have here for us um, Voyagers 1 and 2, Pioneers 10 and 11. I'll, I'll show them. And so we also show, we project them out, not all the way where they're going, because they, they have left the solar system never coming back. These are the fastest things we've ever created. And we have right here the years and the light hours. So here's Voyager 2, the fastest of them. In 2040, it's 25 light hours away. It's, and so once again, think of Neptune's orbit, uh, eight light hours. And so three solar systems, 24 you know, light, uh, uh, you know, light hours or one light day. Well, in 2050, these are launched in 1977. That's an average human lifetime. So these are the fastest things we've sent out and we've put this into the sort of context of a human lifetime. And I want to now move us around. Ooh, okay, there's, the, okay, I gotta see where we're going. Let's see how we gonna move around this way. I wanna bring up the nearest star to us. There's the Magellanic Clouds. There it is, Alpha Centauri, right next to the sun. It's a yellow one out of that pair there. Okay, and it's about the same brightness as the sun. It's actually a triple system. The brightest one is about the uh, brightness of the sun. And it's four and a half light years away. So you gotta say, okay, we got three, we've got three solar systems for a light day, 365, about a thousand solar systems for a light year, 4,000 solar systems to get out to Alpha Centauri. These are the fastest things we've ever created, the Voyagers and the Pioneers, joined now by the New Horizons spacecraft with the ashes of Clyde Tombaugh on board. He's the guy who discovered Pluto. And you ask yourself, interstellar travel. The nearest star, four light years away, and we're looking for dimmer stars around us. I have a whole bunch of data sets I could bring up, I'm not gonna bring up, because I just wanna get you out there. But we're gonna swallow up the entire solar system into the glare of the sun, treated now in brightness as we're treated, treating the other stars. And as I move around, see how Alpha Centauri has already come off the wallpaper? Well, let's move out. And as I do, we're joined by Sirius and Procyon over here, eight and a half light years, 11 light years. This is Pollux and Castor out here. These are familiar stars. The stars of Orion, very far away. They're still pretty far away. There's Aldebaran, and this is Capella. And we see the Milky Way becomes our new sort of logical horizon in which to sort of judge ourselves. I should have mentioned to you that, um, you know, um, going around the Earth in 90 minutes is pretty fast. The Apollo astronauts had to go even faster to get to the moon. It took them three days to get to the moon. Um, and, uh, and that's an amazing thing. But we cover the Earth to moon distance in our speed around the sun in about four hours, it's between the time you wake up in the morning and have lunch. We're traveling eight times that speed around the galaxy. So the galaxy is what we're talking about here. So it's our local surrounds, I'm gonna pull out and I want to show you a census of planets that we now know of around other stars. I'm not going to show you the planets, but I'm going to show you the locations of the stars that have planets. We maintain and update this catalog as these, as these data come in. I did not load, I'm sorry, the Kepler database, which is all off in one section of sky, but these are the dynamical stars. And to make sense of this, I got to bring up something else. For that, I'm going to bring up the Earth's latitude and longitude stretched out in, into space, 75 light years in, in radius. This is how far our radio signals have reached out into space. So if you're out here, just at the edge, you'd be hearing you know, about World War II and radar, early radar, and TV, early TV carrier wave signals. And we're listening for aliens, for ET out there. We haven't heard from anybody, but all these planets have heard from us. 
And so you've got to start thinking about this in different terms of not only space, but time. I want to bring you around to the Hyades star cluster 150 light years away, because it's a good place to look back at the center of the galaxy. Here's, here's that star cluster. Whoops, I went outside my control window. There it is. OK, so here's the Hyades star cluster right there. It's the face of Taurus the bull. It's a beautiful star cluster. And it gives me a moment I can twist this around. So I'm going to, OK, my new sort of horizontal my new landscape out here of, of stars, and looking back at the radio sphere. I'm going to pull back now so I can see this perspective. There's the Pleiades going by. And that's 400 light years. If you were out here looking back with a really good telescope and looked at Florence, Italy, you might see a guy with gray hair with a telescope, Galileo. And now we move out of the galaxy. The galaxy has about two to 300 billion stars. We're in a fairly stable circular orbit around the galaxy. The center of the galaxy is about 25,000 light years away. What were we doing 25,000 years ago? <laughs> art. We were doing art in caves. We were making stone tools. We did that pretty good. Take a light beam about 100,000 years to cross the galaxy. Um, that's the Magellanic Clouds. It was a large Magellanic Cloud just came by my face. We're now at about 150,000 light years away. Looking back, we'd see the first Homo sapiens walking the planet. It takes us 250 million years to make one circuit around the galaxy. When we were in that location, one turn back, what were we doing? What was our DNA doing? We were crawling out of the oceans for the first time. The mud skippers, you know, they were pioneering the land. Later, to evolve into dinosaurs, one quarter turn back, 60 million years ago, the dinosaurs all got roasted by an asteroid, and then the atmosphere heated up to 500 degrees, and we had big barbecue for a while. <laughs> and uh, we still see their bones. We put them in our museums. The galaxies beyond every one of these galaxies is about the size of the Milky Way beyond the, the small ones and close. So that's Andromeda going by out there. It's 2 million light years away. The red thing at the bottom is the Virgo cluster, 60 million light years away. And then finally, we're fading up now the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. When we started this project, the Digital Galaxy Project, we called it, and I went for my interview, and I went for lunch with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And we, we, uh, we talked about how we, had, we were both kids at the Hayden Planetarium when we were young and uh, all this. And, uh, but then we went to this meeting, and uh, we're talking about the first show. And it was going to just be about the Milky Way galaxy. And I'm like, what are you going to do when you step out the galaxy? And you look back, and I say, what, how about the other galaxies? And Neil goes, whoa, 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 Carter. We got enough problems just to deal with the galaxy. I'm like, but we've got to take the galaxies beyond. You can't just step out of the galaxy. I mean, that's like astronomy 100 years ago. And so what we ended up with was 3,000 galaxies. That was the best map that had been done by a guy named Brent Tully from the University of Hawaii. And by the time we opened in 2000, he had 30,000 galaxies. But he Can told us, what's that? Can anyone find Asgard? Anybody find what? Asgard. <laughs> Uh, anybody uh, find God? There's a documentary of humanoids and they're speaking English accents. Oh, well, well I'm sure. I mean, of course they would. It's, 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 that's a nice language. And they, they were, you know, probably been listening to our broadcasts. Um, so anyway, uh, out here, now we have the Sloan survey of galaxies. Oh, notice how, you know, why is the universe sort of shaped like this? Well, if I dive back in for a second, does entertain me? There's the dust of the galaxy, and it blocks our view. We see lots of stars. And so if you come out edge on like this, you see that that affects the astronomers are looking to avoid those stars. And that's what creates this bifurcation into two sides. And it's also biased for more data on the right, because that's the northern hemisphere. and the southern hemisphere, less resources. But there's the two degree field survey, which is great. Now you're seeing the large scale structure of the universe. And if I pull out, we see the quasars that are basically baby pictures of galaxies that are billions of years in the past. Those are supermassive black holes, um, galaxies, uh, small galaxies, cannibalizing um, other galaxies and building larger galaxies. And that process creates active galaxy nuclei or pouring gas on the black hole. When you do that, it's very bright. That's the quasars. We don't see quasars close to us because we've evolved into a mature galaxy. But if we pull out far enough, we see the microwave background, and we just barely see that. Um, and 
we see these Easter egg colors. The colors, the yellows, are are slightly warmer than than the blues, and that that slight temperature variation is magnified by about a hundred thousand. Um, but it's very very smooth, and that is the echo of the Big Bang, and everything that we can chart. And we've put this together accurately for scale and size and look back time and which cosmology. You have to do all this to get the, the, the numbers right and everything. To come up with this picture, which is our picture of the universe, essentially our picture. Imagine for a second that you're one of these galaxies out here. We see a baby picture of you billions of years ago. Well, if you're out here, you'd be in the present and we'd be in the past. You see baby pictures of us. So you would have a look back sphere that's bigger in one direction than we can see and we can see more in the other direction. How big is the universe? It could be infinite. We don't know. But this is as much as we can chart. Charting is one thing. We also see wherever we look um, in different scales too that we cannot account for all the matter <laughs> or for the dynamics. So the behavior of what we see we see all this behavior, like galaxies rotating too fast and clusters lensing the background. We know that there's dark matter out there that outweighs us by a factor of about five to six. And the other thing, too, is that we're now finding that the universe, instead of slowing down, is speeding up, which is what we call dark energy. And if you add in the dark energy, that's about 75% of the mix. About 20% of the mix is dark matter. So everything that I've just shown you is baryonic matter that we can look at, see at pinch, you know, it's you and me, and we can drink beer and all that kind of stuff. That's all baryonic matter. That's less than 5% of the big picture. So let's cruise back home. And how am I doing for time? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Look back time. Woo! Okay, here we go. And I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And I knew it. I came back to the wrong planet. Okay. <laughs> you know, you get out there, you get kind of lost. So what, I'm going to just jump back to Earth for us here. And uh, uh, there we see the, uh, well, there's my country. Let's go over to your country. Actually, what I really like about Singapore is that you guys are this island and you're all trying to figure out how to move into the future and how to do things right. Um, we have to do that as a planet. So I actually think Singapore is a good model for what we got to do in the future um, on the planet. So that's, that's another reason I like being here. And uh, whoops, let me see if I can get the, oh, there we go. We can rotate us back. So we can see that. And now we can see the twin typhoons. We saw them in the beginning, but I'll come in. The next typhoon after this one, I don't even know their names, but they're pretty threatening. And there's been a whole chain of them. And here we can see Leyte over here um, in the Philippines. We also see that sun glint off the ocean that follows the camera. But there's, there's the evil eye of the next big typhoon coming in. So anyway, you guys have been really good, thanks. <laughs> I think I'll cut it off here. There's a lot more I could show. If some of you want to see stuff, stuff later, we can do that. But anyway, um, thanks. Okay. <laughs> should, should I just leave the background running? Okay, I can do that. Can we hit some lights back on? Can we take some questions? Yeah, sure, sure. A absolutely. Yeah. Can I pilot? <laughs> What's that? What's the matching word, CJ? Please. Please. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you heard of Planet Lab? They are also sending independent micro satellites in the orbits. From here? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, they are actually a Silicon Valley based on it. I have heard of, of uh, Planet Labs. I have so heard of Planet Labs. They are kind of a chart out using a really a small... Their aim is to have... Like Dynamic hours, data every yeah, day. Okay. Hours, one yeah, that's like they're granny, granny. right, and so they're, they're looking at really creating a yeah, giant kind of number. Small, yeah. yeah small of microsats, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So um, Planet.com. Mm -hmm. So they are. I think they are really grabbing a lot of data in terms of pictures. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can collaborate with them or all kind of. So one of the things that we did with uh, Pluto, I, I could show this later if you want, because I'm going to move on. But um, um, this is sort of the old software. 
And it, it kind of, I reached, we reached a point with it. It's, it's, a, it's a company, it's a product. And so I, I couldn't really go, I'll just come up here where we don't see the seam so much, we'll let the earth kind of parade by. Um, and uh, so we have this new open source uh, software and that sort of really opens up the picture. Um, one of the things that I had in like a slideshow that I've got on the Mac side and I could show is that um, we share, we can network we can network this th this software around the globe, and we've done that. Um, uh, but the uh, the open source software, we, we just did this on a global scale during the Pluto encounter on July 14th. And um, let's see, so we, we were out of New York, uh, where we had Neil deGrasse on stage, and I was up there with him. We had, um, uh, we had the IMAX screen, so we had 600 people in New York standing room. Uh, it was being controlled by my student who was at Mission Control. And then we had a Google Hangout session um, here to Singapore, uh, the Science Center, and also to NTU, um, but also Brisbane, Australia, Tokyo, um, Ghana, Africa, the first sub-Saharan planetarium there. Um, we were um, Bolzano, Italy, um, the home port in, in Linköping in, in Sweden. They hosted the, the server that we were all logged into. Um, Hamburg, Germany. Um, Buenos Aires uh, in South America, we had um, Houston, uh, Chicago, Monmouth University in New Jersey, and so we were on all the continents except Antarctica, but people were listening at McMurdo Station, which was pretty cool. So anyway, we, we pretty much covered the globe. So right after Encounter, I got in a car and I drove down to Mission Control for the acquisition of Signal. And all these people there, except the scientists, we had scientists interviewed we were showing a simulation because the pictures were going to come in the next day or so. But we wanted to show the visualization so we could all share in the moments. It's like, wow, we're at Pluto. It's like, what are we going to see? And everybody said, there's nothing to see. And it's like, well, that's why we have to create a simulation, a visualization to see exactly what's going on. And there was software for mission planning and stuff like that. The graphics sucked. And it was like, so what are we going to see? It was like, you got to make something that's like going to project big and look good, you know. So it's okay. There's a lot goes into this and make the images look good and everything. All right. But we go down there, and except for the select few that understood what we had done this global event, you know, they've got the engineers walking in, waiting for the acquisition of signal, and they're all waving these American flags. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, America, you know. So it's like, man, you know. So anyway, it was, was kind of nice to think that for an event like going past Pluto, that it was a global event, and the world had was interested and, and cared, you know. And, and at that point, from that perspective, we look back and see this tiny little thing, which is us, a pale blue dot. Carl Sagan talked about it. All this, and that's I mean, it's like it's your Earth rise, whatever. Is that you get out to this perspective, and you don't see the borders. You see how scary thin the atmosphere is, and you understand this global condition, and that that's sort of what it's about. So anyway. I don't know if there are any other questions. <laughs> I should shut up. Yeah. So how does this work? Is this like a million pictures stitched together? What this is, is this is using a web map server protocol, which is essentially a resolution pyramid. And so if I back off, there's a, you can look at this on a web browser, NASA Gibbs, G-I-B-S, Global Image Browsing Service. So just Google that, NASA Gibbs, and you'll see it. And um, so you can zoom in. And, uh, but then also the temporal data is there. And so if you back off and look at the whole world, and if you scroll, and if you have a good internet connection, you know, or if it's caching, you, know, see, you can get kind of a week of data and then you can kind of scroll back and forth and see all the cloud patterns moving back and forth and all that. There's a new satellite, the Himawari 8 satellite, which I th was showing in the very beginning. And that's here. I'll put it up. And ooh, ooh, ooh. let me run the, okay. And this was, okay. This was today. There it is. And there you see, this is 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, you see those, those things moving along. Japan, they, they do two and a half minute intervals. And you can really see the dynamics. That's 11,000 pixels wide. And for Visual SG, which is the visualization Singapore, in November, we've talked to the guys at SunTech, that big video <laughs> wall of the SunTech uh, Conference Center, and we're hoping to put it up on oh, that wow. video wall. 
And then you'd see it not at full res, because they don't have the servers that can really handle it, but theoretically that could handle it, because it's 11 HD screens tall, and it's an 11,000 pixel image. This website, if you write that down, uh, if you search for Himawari 8, this is like buried way down somewhere, but you can zoom in on this, which is really pretty cool. And um, if I actually go to that image, might, let's see, okay, Asia Pacific, I'll just quickly go to it, and there it is, go back to, okay, this was, um, there's the image, by the way, I'm scrolling across just one time step, I think that's Singapore down here. Uh, there's Borneo. Yeah, okay. So, um, and I'm not sure if I'm at full res. Oh, I can go even closer. Do -do -do. There you go. That's full res, and it'll take a second. It'll refresh. But, yeah. And this is every 10 minutes. So you can see the atmosphere boiling. It's amazing. You see the cloud towers. You see the sun glint uh, off of Hawaii. It's, I mean, it's just, you can trance out on this forever. <laughs> so... Anyway, I don't know if there are any other questions. Probably one more question. Yeah. yeah. How, many, how many of these satellites are kind of uh, not working, but still they're orbiting? Uh, space junk? Yeah. Lots of space junk. Um, that's a really good question. And it's also, um, I think when you get into the space debris issue, um, you get into the you know, worrisome debris, which is like, um, you know, the Chinese blew up one of their other satellites to kind of show they could. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, you know, they had to move the space station orbit a bit to avoid what becomes a Taurus. If you imagine an explosion, it blows stuff in all directions. So if you blow stuff higher, then it's going to slow down. And if you blow stuff closer to the Earth, it's a lower orbit, it's going to speed up. And then you blow stuff sideways. So all of a sudden, what it creates is a giant Taurus of crap. And then if you hit that at 17,500 miles an hour, and if you're going the other direction, well, it's like 36,000 miles an hour, that's a bad day. Um, and so you don't, you, you know, you, if you all see the movie Gravity, it's like, oh man, you know, this is like a real issue. So, so I, I, I don't think we really know, because it, then you get down into the small stuff. But as far as um, satellites that are not operational, if you go to Celest Track, C E L E S T R A K or something, Celest Track, whatever. That's where you can. We I go there to update the kernel so we know exactly where the satellites are, and I can show you exactly where the satellite is taking. Or even this image, you know, it'll have a it'll have a data point, and it tells you where all that stuff is. And sometimes it'll say active or. Uh, you know, it's a pretty good thing. It, it, they get their data from NORAD, the North American Air Defense tracking stuff, and the, it's amazing that it's on the web. So it's it's uh, it's it's pretty scary. It's sort of out there. I was letting the thing pan around in the back, so let me just I'll leave it like that, and I'll get off the podium. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna.